Thank you all for coming out tonight. I know it's, it's in a way your Monday. And I'm always just so pleased when I see people come out, parents come out to hear what I might have to say about parenting, about being a parent. And it means already I know that you really care, that you really, you're really striving, you're really trying to, to do your best. And it's an overwhelming place to be a parent. <laughs> when I was a parent that many years ago, I have uh, two children. One is um, 36, I believe, and um, my daughter, Emmy, and our son is uh, 33, Zach. Um, and so I know Emmy is now a parent, and I see myself reflected in her as the grandparent now of twin grandsons. Um, and I hope tonight to, to share with you some of these secrets that I found from my Waldorf mentors that made my life happier and less stressed. Sometimes I say that these are the five secrets to creative parenting, but today I chose happy and less stressed. So you have to let me know at the end if you think any of these ideas are going to make you happy and less stressed. So we'll see how I do. I wanted to share with you that as a, as a young mother of two children, I, I've our daughter was born when I was 21, um, and they were three years apart, as you just heard. I had super high ideals. I had an education major. I was, I was in university. I was just finishing up my teaching credential. Oh, I had such great earnestness with lots of angst. I wanted to do such a good job to, to do what, you know, the learn from my parents, but do an even better job, right? That's what we all want to do. But I was really finding a challenge between figuring out what's my child's needs and my child's wants. I want to be my child's friend, but it's not really working. I really try not to make them into these little adults, but I keep doing it. Um, how, why do I feel so personally affronted when they misbehave? I know better. Why, am I, why do I keep doing that? <sighs> how can I achieve any balance? That, those were really big questions for me, but I just kept charging on, um, really trying to do the right thing. And wow, was I lucky to find Waldorf education when, um, well, first when our daughter was about six years old, I found out about it, and then, just a few years later, I really got the, the super gift of getting to work with a, a Waldorf teacher and mentor because our little homeschool co-op turned into a kindergarten, a little kindergarten on this woman's property. And her name is Nancy Poor, if any of you know her. And she became my fairy godmother. Uh, I was so lucky to, to find her. And she, I, I got to assist with her and watch her work with my son, who was a very needy guy. He was um, a very heartfelt little boy who, who I had parented in such a way that he wanted all my attention. And so I latched on to her and would ask her numerous questions after watching her over the course of the three or four hours at her ranch and just watched her you know, do these amazing things and know exactly when it was a need versus a want, uh, and I just really tapped into all that she had to share with me. And then I was lucky to have even more mentors as I went into Waldorf teaching. And I feel like I've got these gems in my pocket that I always want to keep giving out. And lucky for me, um, my twin grandsons, who are four now, um, were born just at the time when our daughter was um, in residency. And so I went and lived with them just that many years ago and feel like I, I have this understanding and respect for what it takes to be a parent. Because after you're, you haven't parented young children in a while, you, you start to remember it in a different way. Like it was all rosy and happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so easy. And so I'm, I'm hoping that I can weave in some stories of what I've experienced as a, as a very in-house grandmother along the way. Are there any really burning questions you want to make sure that we cover tonight? That you're, that's just right on the tip of your tongue. Yes. So I feel that I never have enough time and guilt. 
Yes. 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 The big G. Thank you. Anything else? So feel free, any, as I'm talking, just you feel free to interrupt me at any time. Not interrupt, but raise your hand. You won't be interrupting me. Um, and just let me know if you want to know more about something or, oh, that, that reminds me of the question I had. Um, so knowing the ages, I might focus more on the zero to 14 year old, but I'll try to I'll weave in um, a few gems that I learned along the way with with the 14 to well, 21 year old, but really more like 18 or 19. So let's get started with the, the, the first um, little secret that that I learned. And I always like to talk about Goldilocks and her search for the just right chair or the just right bed, right? And the warm porridge. And for some reason, a, a few years ago, I decided it was mama's chair and bowl and bed that was really the just right. But then I realized, no, I was off. It's the baby one. But beside the point, when we look at Goldilocks and her search for that warm porridge, that to me is a great analogy for where we want to try to move towards. It was a, a huge gem that was given to me about how it's, it's normal for us to fall into the hot style of parenting or the cool style of parenting. It's just, it is normal. We're, we're always vacillating. But how can we find this balance between the two and figure out how we can understand the moment or the time that we need to be a bit more hot, a bit more authoritarian? And when do we need to let go and, and not notice something. When is that really healthy to do? And so you can see on your, your sheet here a picture of three styles. Sometimes I even put a fourth style in that's way over on the right side that's cold. But I thought today we would just look at this here. And you can see that if we're too firm, we've got this more aggressive nature to us. But if we have too much freedom, too much flow, we're too loving, which I think I often fell into as a, as a new parent, we get too permissive. And we're looking, we want to look for that middle road of empathy, of warmth, of balancing the yin and the yang, the flow and the form. How can we cruise along in that middle ground and know when we need to set an appropriate limit that doesn't have to come down kabonk on the child's head. And when is it, like I said, that we can go with the flow, let them get a little too crazy, and then we can button things up after, after that out breath. I think what the, the balance, this balanced mentor, or I like to say gardener, that's a new, a new concept for me from a book called The Gardener and the Carpenter about parenting. But I think what's important is to look at how listening and observing is really crucial and how we, we need to know how to respect the child over time, that we need to see how the child is gradually developing and that it, there isn't just one cookie cutter uh, instruction manual that we can use. We have to be creative. It's, it's just the way it is because the child's slowly coming in to her earthly home. And it's not an easy trip to, f to come into this um, body and to figure out what everybody else knows. It's a journey. And we need to be ready to take that long haul with them and to make sure that our expectations aren't too high or too low. Because I think sometimes when our expecta expectations are so high, then that's where often we move into that authoritarian role and we get quite strict. But if our expectations are too low, then the child really suffers because they need that. They need enough form to, to grow. So what my mentors really guided me to see, uh, didn't, they didn't share with this, these parenting styles with me. I came upon those later. But what they really shared was the fact that if you understand how the child develops, you'll know if your expectations are at the right place. 
And so that's going to be our second secret is we need to try to go with the flow of their developing capacities instead of trying to swim upstream when it's not really going to work and they win. I don't know if you ever feel that where it's like, I'm trying my best, but they just won. Whoa. And when I, when I think of these, these uh, developmental phases that children go, go through, I, I remember that when I was holding Emmy right after she was born, and I could just feel all this potential that she had, that she was, here was this little being, so fresh, like an open flower, and just feeling like, what, what's, going to, what's going to happen? What's going to be? And you can just feel all the, the beauty of the spiritual world around these little babies and how much we want to give them this protective environment that they can feel all, all the love and nurturing that they need, that they can feel that we're, we're giving them that time that they need, that we're, we're right there um, protecting them and letting them grow slowly. But then as life would have it, I don't know if this happened to you, but all of a sudden when all of her individuality, all that potential I saw as she's there in my arms starts to express itself around two or three years old, I suddenly had this different idea of what her environment should look like. And I was really, um, as I now see it, looking like a carpenter and thinking, you know, you just need to follow my instructions and then all will be well. And she was, as all children, you know, don't always see the necessity to follow all of our instructions. So we know that their perception and their, their thinking as a child is going to be very different. I think, you know, just being a parent, being, trying to work with a two-year-old, you know right away that it's quite different. Um, and, and they really can't access what I call that higher self, that individuality, that has, that has that destiny to fulfill until their early 20s. And so we need to step into that place for them. So let's look at the capacities they do hold at these different seven-year periods. And of course, there's like little mini cycles. How many of you are familiar with the, the phases of childhood? So you're pretty, you're, you're Maybe what I'll do is I'll um, hear from you. From zero to seven, how about you share with me what are some of the basics of, seven, of zero to seven-year-olds? What do we know about them in terms of their development? Yes? Um, they're very physical. They're, mm -hmm. That body is forming. Mm -hmm. So much of their expression comes out of the physical body, how they encounter the world. Sure. They use that. Another? Yes. Yes. They're a total sponge, just taking everything in. Another? Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of united. So basically, um, you as a parent are everything for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then later on, they're kind of more separating from, yes. from you. Mm -hmm. They really truly believe that you are them and they are you and that you know everything that they know or, or are thinking. And they think they own everything, don't they? They think they can take hold of everything and, and be everything, no boundaries, want everything, yeah? Mm -hmm. And yeah? You just thrive with rhythm. <coughs> mm -hmm. Truly, yeah. All this energy is going into building up their body, and they really need that rhythm to hold on to. Yeah. Yes. Um, kind of along the same lines, but exploring through sensory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Touch. Yeah. They, and they have this competing need to always be checking in with you to see, are you there for me? Are you there for me? And then to go out and explore. You know, and so sometimes it can seem like they're actually purposely being naughty as they're going after something of precious of yours and looking at you like this, right? I've seen many parents who feel like, 
well, look at that. He's just like watching me as he's doing something he knows he's not supposed to do. And it's important to realize that that's really not what's going on in their mind. They just want to keep tabs on, is this okay? Is this okay? And I have to explore. Yeah. Excellent. And play. How about play? What do we know about play? Mm -hmm. It's their whole, it's how they process everything they're seeing and learning. Mm -hmm. It's through how can I incorporate this into play or how does this, what does this look like in the imagination world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's their work. So much. So now let's move to 7 to 14. What do you know about that phase? What can we say about them? These, yeah. This is when they fall out of paradise. Mm -hmm. They realize mm -hmm. I'm an individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. About halfway, <clears throat> about halfway through, they really get that that hit at the nine-year-old change. Yes. And how? What is their thinking like? What would you say? In the in the zero to seven, their thinking is in their we call it in their willing that they're thinking through through their limbs through their mouth, and we can see that they're, they're learning to think th through that doing. How about with the 7 to 14 year old? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talk about how they're thinking through their imagination, that these um, life forces that are really building up the physical body from 0 to 7 um, can now be freed up a bit because growth, physical growth slows down so that the child now has more capacity to hold on to long-term memories. There's different structures of the brain that start to develop, and so now they're capable of a new kind of thinking that can seem sometimes a bit logical, but it's actually what we call imaginative thinking. It's a magical thinking that incredible things can happen. It can look like they're right with you and taking it in and understand what you're saying, and then it can come out in a whole different way <laughs> later on. And sometimes you, you can see that when they come home with a story of something that happened at school. Um, and then when you talk to the teacher, it, it can be mm, sort of like that, but not all the way. So, so they, have, they, they live in a more imagin imaginative world, especially before nine years old. Um, and it's just gradually, in, um, right around 11 or 12, that some of this logical thinking can be accessed because the left hemisphere is a little bit slower in its development. And so we see that there's, there's a gradual process towards beginning logic around 11, 12. I would say, too, that, that they really want to belong at 7 to 14. Have you noticed that yourselves? How, which ways have you seen that? Do you have a way? When it comes to the old friends, how they always to play, and then he wants to play with his old friends, but they're doing something different in little groups, and he, you know, it really takes it mm -hmm. deeply when it's when he's not part of that group that yeah. the groups it's with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, you can really feel the our tribal, our tribal nature, our innate um, desire to to belong to a group. And they really live in admiration of adults. They really want to understand what you're doing. They want to get in there and do it with you. They, they, they so are so curious about the world. And sometimes you can see they get special interests now that they really want to delve into something. It's beautiful to see. And play is still a big part of their work, living in this heart realm. Um, what about, have you noticed that they start to judge and compare? Have you noticed that? Yeah. And they start to, to uh, test the waters in, in, in comparing you to others. I remember one day just when my daughter was in the throes of the nine-year-old change, and it was a Saturday morning and we had had breakfast and it was our usual thing for you know, all nine years of her life that after we ate um, breakfast on Saturdays, we would do chores. We would clean up the house. And she had her, her set of chores. Everybody went off to do their thing. And I saw her on the top of the stairs crying. Like, 
oh my goodness, Emmy, what happened? Why are you crying? What's wrong? She said, I must have been adopted <laughs> because you're just so mean to me. I think, I think I just was taken away from my parents and brought to you. And I was so, I was so taken aback, and I tried, I tried not to laugh because it was just so amazing. Um, but it just really hit me in terms of, you know, these different um, changes they go through, and just trying to understand um, what, how, how is this life? How, how do things work? And I said, oh, you must be so upset about doing your chores today. <laughs> yes, I am. You know, and she just was having one of those bad days. Well, let's move on to 14 to 21. What can you say about that time in your life? What would you say? Um, anything you know about what happens at that point? How about our thinking? What do you feel like happens with our thinking? Critical and realistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Moves to more critical, realistic thinking. Yes. Impulsive. And impulsive. I would say chaos. <laughs> and chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Teenagers have it super rough, you know, in terms of brain development. They go through a huge restructuring of the brain. There's a lot of pruning that happens. And brain researchers say it's similar to the, the terrible twos, the kind of remodeling that's happening. Um, this is a time that, that children really want a mentor. They really are searching for adults who they think are specialists that, that hold a key. And their peers are really important to them, and they need to be, because now's the time that they need to start separating from their parents. But it's a powder keg, this chaotic time, because right, it's at this point, this juncture where you've got you know, foggy thinking that's sort of logical and you think you're pretty logical, but then you're not aware of dangers and you want to get closer to your peers. You need to, to separate from your family and, and become an adult. And then you've got all these dangers in our society that can happen to you when you need to test those waters. You need to, to go out even farther than the, than the, um, older seven to 14 year old. So it's a, it's a really challenging time for them. They really want to see that the world is true. They really, they really want to know that it's true. They're going to be asking that of you. Um, and they really need now apprenticeship. They need, they need opportunities to do good work in things that they're interested in. And that really keeps them engaged. And they're going to want to negotiate. They're going to want to be the lawyer <laughs> and push your boundaries. Now, another piece is to look at with these general um, seven-year stages that we just blew over really quickly. Thank you for your help on that. Is also temperament. It's also looking at the personality of each unique child. And Steiner gave us um, some beautiful gems in bringing a picture of the four temperaments. You can see that sometimes in Briggs Meyer inventory, if you know that. And how many of you are, are versed in the four temperaments? Iffy, yeah. <laughs> and can you name them? How about we name them first? What do we got? Sanguine, Sanguine melancholic, melancholic choleric. choleric, and phlegmatic. And what's interesting about these temperaments is we're never usually just one. What, what Steiner shared with us is that usually we're a, a compilation of three, and we have one that's pretty weak. If we have one that's super strong, that's a challenge for us, yeah? Especially as parents and wanting this, what, what I love this term, what we want is goodness of fit. And so sometimes when we have a child that has a preponderance of one temperament, boy, that's, can, that can be a hard goodness of fit, meaning the parent has to really understand not only these, these um, seven-year phases, but also what this child needs. And that's going to be a, a little bit tougher. So I'm, I'm going to kind of speed through the temperaments and, and please ask for a full um, 
study of temperaments, or maybe you might even want to delve into it on your own. There's lots of great books about it, and you could study with other people. But if we look at um, the two more inward temperaments, what would you say? What do you think those people who know them, what do you think they would be? Melancholic, Melancholic and, phlegmatic. and phlegmatic, yes. So melancholy, we know that term. Phlegmatic is, you think of a stuffed up nose, right? <laughs> but um, <laughs> yay, I love to get a laugh. <laughs> um, so melancholic, you know, these are our deep thinkers. This is Mother Teresa, Abraham Lincoln, you know, people who, who take on um, the weight of the world and really want to give. Now, another side of the, the melancholic is someone who takes all of that, that care and that, that deep thought and brings it inward. You know, and that's the little child that has a tiny, tiny gut, like, and needs a Band-Aid, yeah? But, the, these are usually those who look after other people so very well and, and really think about the, the challenges of life. Now, phlegmatics, on the other hand, what could we say about them? What do you know? I'd like to get audience participation. Yes? They have to be cozy. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I hear something over here. Yeah? They love to be cozy. Yeah? <coughs> yes, they're also thinkers, uh, planning ahead, especially often they, they, they love thinking about um, those creature comforts, so like when's my next meal, you know, when's the next thing going to happen. They love rhythm. They love to have rhythm in their life. Yeah, any other bits of the phlegmatic? I live with a, a phlegmatic husband, and I love him because he's always looking after me. You know, he's making, making sure that, that the meals are, are there and, and that everything, everything's gotten paid. And, you know, once we finish one vacation, he's kind of thinking already what might be the next one, and I love that about him. So they're very steadfast and loyal. They can often be so dreamy that they're hard to get out of the house. Um, they might be very slow in their learning, um, that kind of thing, but steadfast and loyal. Let's look at the more outer temperaments. We've got the choleric and the sanguine. And sanguine, the sanguine temperament, is what Steiner called the overarching temperament of childhood. What do we know about sanguines? Help me out. Yeah. They have a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. They're very open to just going. Yes. Let's just go. Lots of energy. Go, go, go. Social butterfly. They're very busy in, in making plans for everybody, being friends with everybody, going from here to there to everywhere. Any other thing that we want to add to the same one? Communicator. Communicator, yes, a weaver. How about choleric? Often people, when they talk about temperaments, they start with choleric. I like to have them be the end. Because <laughs> they always like to be first. <laughs> They're the leaders. They're the leaders. They have a mission. They have a plan. And they're sure that everybody's going to follow them and do what they want. And if not, they will make sure <laughs> that they change their mind. So they can often be the bull in the china shop. Yeah? Anything else that you want to add about cholerics? Firefighters. Firefighters? Yes. They, I would say that they can often be the brave ones going out to, to help others. They, do, they definitely have... Um, that connection with melancholics where they want to do good for people. They definitely do. So you can see, looking at your own child, if they have, like I said, too much of one temperament, or maybe they're a mix of temperaments, maybe they have two temperaments that are at direct opposition to your two strong temperaments or three, you know, it can't quite be three, but you get what I mean. You can be at loggerheads often because you can feel like, I just don't understand him. And it's, it's true. And that's where we got to pull ourselves up 
and really work on being that wise elder and rising up past that and looking for how can I get that goodness of fit? Is it getting a little warm in here for you? Or is it okay? Yeah? All right. Great. So again, as this elder, we know that the child is just slowly evolving, slowly developing, incarnating. And I love this picture of the gardener, that we need to be the gardener parent, that we need to see that the zero to seven-year-old is like a seed with all this potential, and that we need to nurture that seed, that it isn't a set of instructions that we can follow. Definitely, we're going to create an environment that is going to let that seed grow, but we know that there's some things that are out of our control. You know, we can try our best to, to nurture the soil and make it the best for that seed, but it might not be exactly the perfect mix. It might be that that seed also isn't going to sprout in the way another seed will. It might be that the, the water quality isn't what we wanted, and we have no idea. We have to be okay with the fact that there's going to be some things out of our control, but that we're going to stand firm and look after that seed, that seedling, that mature plant, until it reaches fruition. And we're going to know that it's, 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 it's going to be, it's going to be a, a situation where it's not always happy, not always fine. But we're going to trust that the child chose us as his parent for a reason, and that we're up for the task, and that we're going to learn from each other. And definitely, seeing our child not as our possession, but as someone that we're going to guide through life. And one thing that really helped me um, in this area is to think of my child as coming from a foreign country or an alien planet sometimes, because it seemed like maybe she did. <laughs> and how would I treat someone from another country coming into my culture? I don't know about you, but I've had the opportunity to live in two very different cultures in Nigeria and just recently in, in Tanzania. And people were just so kind to me, helping me learn all the different ways of living there that I had no idea. And I feel like it's a really great analogy for us as we guide our children through life, when they're making us want to tear our hair out, to, to see that ah, maybe if I just look at it this way, maybe it'll help me know how to guide him. Maybe it's that he just doesn't know how to do it. I'm going to give us another analogy, because as in this mentor role, I thought I would just have us go through those three phases and just look at a few more gems in that area of how we can embody this mentor role. And it's not even just in the way we speak, but also the way we hold ourselves um, and the way we think about things. And so just picture that the, from zero to seven, this journey of being a parent and child. Think of um, sitting in a boat with your child. And at zero to seven in this rowboat, you're going to have the oars. And you're going to let the child sit in the front and watch you row the boat and get to watch all the things around him, feel the, the air going past his face, smell the water, look at the sights, and learn from you as you row the boat. And so a few really important things that they need. They truly need lots and lots of time to just be to just be in the right kind of environment where they can watch you, follow you, learn from you. They need time to explore and experiment, as we were talking about earlier. They need to have lots of time for unstructured play. And this isn't just Waldorf education that's saying this. This is mainstream research now, finding that this is a key for a child's success to have this kind of time that the parent isn't structuring and trying to teach something, but just to allow, allow the child to explore and to experiment. That means a lot of open-ended toys, right? As I think I, I might be teaching to the choir here, but I have a feeling you know that. Um, another gem for me that was huge is not to tell, 
or to ask. That really we need to do it with the child. We need to use our words, most definitely, but we also need to be active with the child, doing what's expected at that time. So if it's time to put on shoes, to just call down and say, put on your shoes, isn't going to get you very far. Because the zero to seven year old, and I'm talking more from like four to seven, will have the idea to walk towards the door to get the shoes on, but then they'll see something, right? And they'll want to play with that, and they'll totally forget your words. So really, we need to imbue those words with some magic, and that means putting our will into them. So our will and their will have to work together. It really helps at this time when you have to be, um, have, you have to take the time to show them how to do all these things, that you also use little um, imaginative stories and pretend because they're hovering, you know, just around themselves. And they love when you pretend that, say, for instance, the coat talks. And the coat says, hey, Quinn, I want to go to school with you. And you just start putting on the coat instead of asking aloud, I wonder if you'll need a coat today because the answer from the child will be, oh, no, 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 don't, don't need that coat. <laughs> and so you have to think about, okay, what am I going to say aloud? And what am I going to keep to myself? And that helps keep things nice and happy. They also love singing. So when it's time to clean up, you know, in the kindergarten, that they'll just start singing a song. And it's like the kindergarten teacher is a Pied Piper and can just bring those children in to do whatever, whatever she wants. Um, I think another thing that I've noticed is that when a child is misbehaving at this age from zero to seven, and again, I'll talk about more like three to seven, that an, another key is to use gestures that are inviting, that bring them in. So, for instance, just this um, last week or two, I was with... Um, my grandsons, and Quinn would decide, he's four years old, he would decide to, you know, I could see he's starting to get tired, and so he started to get really loud, and his mom would say, you know, you need to quiet down, and then he would take something and run, and, you know, he was just starting to spiral out. And if she ran after him and started to raise her voice, things went downhill. Whereas if she scooped him up, you know, and said, I'm the monster, and then scooped him up and gave him a hug and, and talked to him quietly. Like, now we're going to be going up to the bathtub. It was a whole different picture. So to bring um, these warm gestures to the zero to seven-year-old, to, to use different voices, to, to speak in, in an imaginative way, is such, a, is such a gift for them to try to keep the irritation out of our voice, yeah? <laughs> um, and to use gesture. A few, a few bits um, that I call form is that I think at this time, it's really important for both parents to get on the same page and to start to form a family identity, to talk about this is what we do in our family and to, to really picture that the child is coming in and we are a family, we're, we're a team, and we're going to work together. It helps for you then to be able to say, well, this is how we do things. And you'll see how that gradually builds over the years and really helps the child feel a strong sense of identity with his parents, which um, recently I've heard is, a, is an issue now because more and more children are connected to, to their screens and connected to another part of the world and as their parents are also connected to screens and are very busy. And so there can be this, this um, thinning of the thread of identity of a family and the child is more connected to peers or, or to uh, what, you know, avatars or such 
And so for us to really knit a strong sense of family identity is important. Um, sticking with that rhythm of the day that someone mentioned. Limiting choices. I think I, think I have a sense you, you know those. Um, I think involving the young child in the activities and chores you're doing can often be an incredible um, gift to the child uh, because then, again, you're building that family identity and the child can then participate with you and then go and play and come back with you and go and play so that you don't have to go and play with them. I don't know if you have that difficulty, but I did as a, as a new parent that I, 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 I didn't make that separation. And my daughter, and, and, and when I was there helping with the boys, we really tried to make that clear, that the child comes to, to do work with us and then can go off and have an out-breath and play, that you don't always have to be completely engaged. It's, a, it's an incredible gift also to them in forming their will forces, in teaching them really healthy habits. And so, for instance, my grandsons now help with cooking. They, they're the ones who put all the things into the bowl. Uh, they love to help with um, getting the clothes out of the dryer, of um, cleaning up all the toys. They've gotten really good at that. Um, I think another big piece is treating children with genuine kindness. So even when they... They, they just have you to the very edge, you know, for, for you to always think, how can I let him know? And one example of that is when my children, when they were young, would want to come up as I'm talking to someone else and just interrupt, right? Or when you get on the phone and they want to interrupt you. And I learned that if I just put my hand, I, I say, excuse me just a minute, and I put my hand on their back and I say, I can see you want to speak to me now, but you'll need to wait. So you wait until we're finished, and then we'll come back. I'll come back to you. And to do that consistently over and over again shows them that you care about them and that you're, teaching, you're letting them know the ways of the world and that you will, you will address their need and, and, and be, be there for them. So it's really covering quite a few areas that we want to we want to build as an elder as an authoritative parent what would you say are some of the ways that we can use our words so they really count for this age because language is has such an important role for an authoritative parent we want to use our words well what would you say from zero to seven what might be some do's or some don'ts do you have any ideas? Mm -hmm. Please say to me once, and I found it to be very useful. <clears throat> if you can say it with a gesture, say it with a gesture, and then your words mean more when you have to use them. So instead of saying, come on over here, we need to get your shoes on, you just say, shoes, and we all go over and put our shoes on. Mm -hmm. Or um, instead of saying, walk in the house <laughs> or hands are for helping that's a big one I would say in the kindergarten oh hands are for helping teeth are for eating food <laughs> <laughs> yes catch them doing good versus mm -hmm. catch them always doing bad <clears throat> exactly. behavior you want to see mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I think and oh yeah go ahead um, 
try to keep judgment out of what I say. Mm -hmm. Stick more to observation and truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and along that line, trying to be logical doesn't really work. Yeah, to, to see if you can give a logical explanation of why they shouldn't be doing something for a zero to seven year olds. They hear this, wah, 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 wah. And they'll go like this, okay, okay. <laughs> and maybe she'll stop talking. <laughs> yeah, and modeling social graces, um, this, I think, can be so easily done with our words, where when they ask for something, we can say, please. And then when we give them something, we say, thank you. And we model for them. And we don't really expect them to, to have to say it after us. But we're just showing them day in and day out what to do. And often you'll find with most children, they'll start saying it. Yeah? Or if they say, give me that. You can say, may I have that, Mama? Yeah. And you just give them the words. And then later, you'll expect it from them. Yeah. I would say another thing that I notice is that sometimes we can um, let our words not count in this way, where we'll be on the playground, we're going to let our kids play for a few minutes, we're talking to our friend, and then we see it's about time to go, um, get home, and we'll say, one more minute, which is great, you know, to give them that warning. That really helps them. But then, one more minute goes by, two, three, four. And then all of a sudden we say, hey, where are you? You know, come now, come now. You know, what's important, I think, is for us to follow through. So if we say one minute, we want to make sure it really is, you know, close to one minute. And if not, we'll say, I'm going to stay a little longer. I'm going to be talking to my friends. So I'll let you, I'll give you the cue again. It's similar too with screens, that the, the children at this age, when you go onto a screen, it's really, really helpful to let them know why, what you're doing. Just a really simple, I'm, I'm texting daddy to see if he can stop at the grocery store. Oh, I'm checking a map to see how we can get there. Because they look at you looking at a screen as you're not interested in me anymore. And the flat affect we have when looking at a screen can often relate for children as anger. That's really interesting. So similarly, with making our words count, just giving them that little heads up. So how about we'll move to 7 to 14, and now we're in that rowboat, and we have the child sit next to us. And we give them an oar, and we take an oar. And we're going to be giving them lessons on how to row this boat. It's a little bit of a different picture now. They really still need lots of time to play and explore. And they're going to, like I said, get into to more specific kinds of play. They're going to find their, their hobbies and such during this time. And we really advocate for gradually bringing in team sports or activities after school that have to do with following uh, more instructions. They have all the instructions during the school day. It's best if they can go home and have that unstructured playtime. Um, they're really in need of beauty. They want to see that the world is beautiful. So the more time they can spend outside in nature and getting to be on their own outside if they can, if they can um, explore and learn from nature, I think that's really quite possible in this area. Um, and if they can especially be outside right before dinner time, it's such a healthy thing for the 7 to 14 year old. Um, I think your presence is crucial at this age. Um, like I said, they really admire adults, and they really love being with you when, when you're doing something that you love. So I know with my children, they spent a lot of time with me outside in these years when I was gardening, and they, they loved to help me with all those things, and I gave them tasks to do. They had, they had chores, um, and we took them out hiking every weekend, and still to this day, 
That's what they'll say to me when I'm with them. Okay, so tomorrow we're going hiking. <laughs> um, the 7 to 14-year-old really needs this time to express his feelings. Now, often it happens right at bedtime. <laughs> they have all these things that they've kind of held from the day, and they want to share it with you. And so you do need to structure the day, uh, the evening, so that they have that time to express their feelings. And yet we need to have uh, interest, but not this incredible investment. Because as you remember, they have this imaginative thinking quality, all right? So it can go, you know, and depending on their temperamental tendencies, it could go very dramatic, right? And you can fret. Ah, nobody likes her at school. Oh my goodness, ah, what's happening? Oh, the teacher never, never, never calls on her. And sometimes what can happen is we get sucked into that vortex of our child's feelings. And we want so much that they're always happy and that they never feel any pain, any emotional pain, any physical pain. Of course we don't. But what builds re resilience, and maybe some of you have read about this now because it's a big thing, of the fact that children need to develop grit, perseverance, resilience, is to listen and nod, affirm that you're hearing it, you know, say, sometimes saying it back to them, and then if you have a concern about something at school, I really advocate for you to go talk to the teacher and, and find out if the teacher knows about this circumstance or go to the parent of the child um, if, it, excuse me, if it happened outside of school and ask before you jump to the conclusion that all of what your child is saying is true. I think also to give the child ideas, to start to tell stories now in a pedagogical fashion so that you tell them stories about when you were young and what it was like um, for you when that happened to you and what you did to, to help with that. Um, I had a, um, a running story that I told my children when they were um, in their early years of this phase about a little fairy, and often I would, and I, would tell that, I would tell them this little story at night, and the fairy often would have some dilemma that was slightly similar to the one that maybe one of my children had during the day, um, or something that I knew that they were working on and needed help with, like maybe sharing their toys with each other, and that fairy would help w with the other characters in the story and she would always be the one to kind of figure things out for them. And then they would go to sleep. Another great resource for these kind of stories is Thornton Burgess. If you, I don't know how many of you have heard of him, but he's the author of animal stories that are great for seven to 10 year olds, like Mother West Wind and uh, Patty the Beaver. And he told these stories to his son when he was young. And so then they go to sleep with that story and they can think about it. And they can start to build up um, this understanding that, okay, I can get through this. I can do this. Um, another piece that I think that's difficult for us for the 7 to 14 year old is to realize that reason doesn't always work so well with them, but just being playful does. So like, for instance, when it's time to clean up their room, to come in and say, yeah, it is now time to clean up room. I will clean books, you clean over there. I see how long it takes, ready, I count, go. I mean, I just was uh, guest teaching with seventh graders, and if I started to count, I don't know, like all of a sudden they just all started moving exactly where they needed to go. And I didn't even say, I'm, I'm, I'm counting to 10. So, you know, find ways uh, to be playful, to, to have some fun um, when you need to get them to do something. Uh, I love this picture from this book, uh, The Danish Way of Parenting. And it talks about how important it, ha it is to have uh, we time. Uh, it's called, I think it's called hoga spelled very differently. 
but it's a time when um, you come together as a family and maybe you cook together. Maybe you all sit down and have dinner together and there are no screens. Or uh, you read books on the couch all snuggled up. This is really, really, really helpful for this age. They need it so much. You want to really expand their, their, um, their boundaries and their responsibilities at this age. It's a big time for them to learn responsibility. <clears throat> you want to start to have some family rules, maybe institute family meetings. Um, you want to expect them now to speak kindly, that that's clear, that that's part of who your family is, and, and that there might be a consequence to that if they can't speak kindly. Our daughter knew that if she couldn't get along well with her brother when she was this age, that then she wouldn't be able to go um, to ride her horses because we needed to see that she could do the right thing at home and be kind so that she could go out in the world and we would know that she would be kind to all people um, that she met there. Um, I think for them to feel like a very important member of the family is key. That they need to have their own chores to do. Uh, and they need to fulfill them. And again, to stop and take the time to show them how to do a chore well is really going to help them a lot. That they don't hear that they've done something poorly, but that, here, let me show you how that chore is going to get done. And I'll, and I'll help you until you can do it the right way. It changes the whole mood <laughs> instead of saying, get back here and do it right. Yeah. Um, I think along with adding these responsibilities that you can start to see how they can start to make some simple choices as to when they're going to get those responsibilities done. So for instance, you get to choose when you're going to clean your room today but it just needs to be done by dinner time. Or I can see now that you are really showing responsibility, so I think you can ride your bike all the way to Joe's house, and I know that you'll be safe doing that. It really helps to start to gradually let those boundaries out little by little, and to always make sure you keep those boundaries um, there, that you don't all of a sudden do this so that you have no more um, boundaries to open up to. I think a few tips in this area is, again, to refrain from asking any questions. Yeah? Uh, will you clean up your room? Yeah? Sometimes we'll say, it's time to clean up your room, OK? So we have to cut off that OK. <laughs> again, being really clear, using I statements. I see your room isn't clean. And it does need to be cleaned by dinner. So you may go ahead and do that now. Um, and when they ask a question, like, why do I have to clean my room? Well, this is what we do in our family. And leave it at that. To go into long explanations isn't going to be helpful for this age. Um, also, I think when they ask to do something, and your first reaction is no, right away no, or they're asking for something. If anywhere in your mind you feel like you might go back on that no, better to fill in with the words, I'll think about it. Because to say no and then say, well, maybe, well, no, maybe, yeah, mm, me, okay, and they can wear you down, that really is going to make your words quite meaningless for them. <laughs> and at this time, as they start to judge and compare, they pick up on that and they look for a, a little crack and they're going to open it. It's just the way that children are. They need to know what those boundaries are. <sighs> so how are you doing? All right? How about we're going to move, I'm going to move to um, secret number four. And that is to see mis misbehavior as an opportunity to learn. I think I mentioned to you um, at the very beginning that 
I was so affronted by my children's misbehavior. I thought that if I tried to do everything right, that they would do everything I wanted them to do. And it's really not normal for us to see misbehavior as an opportunity to learn. Studies have shown that most parents, they're gonna actually notice, they're gonna, they're gonna notice negative behavior, bad behavior, five or six times more than the behavior that a child does well, positive behavior. And that they're gonna ignore 90% of what their child does well. And I, all I can say is I think it's just a, a part of our human nature that we have to, to unlearn and, and teach ourselves a new way. Um, and our immediate gut reaction for most people is similar to what I said, that we feel a, a certain affrontive um, reaction that we go right to the reptilian brain, the emotional brain, and we feel this need to say something, to do something, to, to punish. And really what happens is our self-discipline goes by the wayside, and we think that somehow if we double up on anger, that that's gonna solve the problem. And really what we're teaching them is that I'm stronger than you, and I need to punish you for you to learn. And Steiner had an amazing picture for me that just has helped me turn this around and to really see that when any misbehavior a child has is just his attempt to meet his needs. And so when a child misbehaves, he says, meet it with empathy, meet it with a question. What are you really asking? What, do you, what is it that you're really needing at this time? and see it as an opportunity again to help him learn how to be in the world. And so here's an opportunity maybe for self-control. Maybe it's an opportunity to have compassion. Maybe it's one for sharing. But many, many opportunities for them just to learn how to be in the world and get along with others. Uh, he said another amazing thing that really children come into the world like feral dogs. <laughs> and, and for us to understand that, we need to work towards helping them learn how, how to be in the, in the world. So for me, a couple of gems that really helped is to always hold a positive picture of the child in my mind. Always see all the positive things that the child is doing, especially when she's misbehaving or she's going through one of those valleys, right? Because during these seven-year seven -year phases, we see these times where they just fall apart. And again, that's usually when the brain is doing a big um, overhaul. And we can think, what happened to my kid? <laughs> why, why is she acting this way? And so it's so important to have a real positive picture in your mind. And how you're gonna perceive and treat your child during these valleys is going to be very instructive to her. You know, it's going to really sink in deep. Um, and so that's why not taking her actions or words personally is a real key. I think another gem is to, and I think I mentioned it already, is the child has this innate need to separate from us. And it's not always going to be pretty. And so when, when the child misbehaves or behaves in this way of trying to create separation, I think for us to try to, you know, and I know this might be a big stretch, but to try to respect her impulse, her soul impulse to grow up and, and to be independent, first off, is so helpful. And not to take it as uh, an affront to, to us. Um, now, of course, we have to shape that and help them with how to separate <laughs> in a proper way. Yeah. So, so when a child misbehaves, it's really helpful to ask yourself three quick questions before you do anything. One is, does he know what's expected of him? Maybe I actually haven't made that clear, that he needs to be quiet right now, for instance, you know? that that's what we have to do in a, in a hospital when we're going to go visit grandma, right, for example. That's an easy one to solve, right? Um, it's normal and healthy for them to just 
be who they are and be oblivious to what, what everybody else knows as the rules of our society. And so that's a really helpful one for them to learn. Um, the second question is to say, is to ask, okay, I, I know he knows this expectation, but is it that he just can't control himself? So have I not given enough follow through? Have I told him this expectation, but I haven't made sure that we've practiced enough so that he really knows that's how it has to be. And again, that's an another easy one. Oh, remember that you, you were going to say, may I be excused from the table? So here, you get up back up on the chair and say, may I be excused? And then slide down. Oh, now, look, try it one more time. Oh, try it one more time. Good job. Okay, now. You can go and get your hands washed. The third question really is, is the most serious, and that is, does the child know that expectation? And, and I've taught it, but still he doesn't care. He's going he's gonna to cross that expectation anyway. And those are deeper questions to ask, because that's relationship questions. Um, that's where you really need to step back and look at, what am I doing? Um, am, I, am I giving my child enough of that time that he needs so that he, he knows that I care about him? So that's a big step back. We've got to do a lot more work there. Another key is to connect before we correct. And it goes along with what you were saying. You know, to, to get down to their level or to pick them up, um, to put your hand on their back, on their shoulder, to make loving contact, eye contact, and to acknowledge um, her perspective, right, of, of what she thinks may have been the thing that she just had to do, why you can see why that was so, um, and then tell her your expectation. Um, doing all these things, connecting before you correct, is really going to help the child stay in a calm phase and not go to fight or flight. Because you want to go then to the next step, right, of, of trying to help the child learn what the correct behavior is. So if he's in, if he's in flight, fight or flight or her, they're not going to be able to hear because they're, they have fear. They fear what's, what's going to happen next. It seems like my mom is pretty angry. And so any, any positive teaching that you can do is going to go out the window. Another key is don't get mad, get sad. Yeah, so you want the child to feel that they want to make it better. That if you, if you err on the side of um, n not wanting to show that sadness, then they're going to feel like, hmm, I don't, I don't really, I know that I'm not doing the right thing, but nothing's happening. I, I, feel, uh, I feel abandoned. But if we get too hot, then the child feels like, again, I've been chided, and, and all the good that might come out of any redirection or amends goes out the window. Um, so it's really important to find this middle ground if the child misbehaves in such a way that you really want to show we need to move forward out of this behavior. Don't get mad, get sad. You don't want to move to shame, but to say, I'm disappointed, is helpful. And again, if you feel your anger coming up, it's better instead of giving the child a timeout, for you to take a timeout. Yeah, to say, I'm going to go and, and take some time to think about this, and I'll come back. And that is a great, great behavior for them to, to see you model. I think with young, the younger children, too, this redirection is key, that there's less talking and more just taking them to another activity, yeah, to show them how to use their hands and their words, um, to, if they're yelling in the house, to take them to the door and say, oh, look, your inside voice is waiting at the door 
and your outside voice forgot to stay at the door. Here, let's just switch them, yeah? Um, to, be, to be magical in that way. Um, also, when they, they use their hands in such a way to hurt another, let's have them come and do something to help our family. Let's have them cut some carrots for us or fold some laundry. And then hands, look at the work you did. Now, are you ready to go back to play with, your, with uh, Quinn's brother? And you can take their hands. Are you ready? And you can move their hands up and down. Oh, good. You're ready. Yeah. It's, it helps the, the younger child see that they need to be master of this thing that they're in instead of it's all you. <laughs> Um, from 7 to 14, we really want to move now towards resolution. How can the child make it right when he misbehaves? Um, like I said, they want to be a part of a tribe. And they're slowly awakening to understanding that poor choices must have consequences. So it's really time now that they are held more accountable to, to their mistakes and learn from them. So now we're going to move away from pedagogical stories and, and really talk about with them and have them engage in why the behavior might not have worked. What do you think? Why do you think that didn't work out? Yeah, when, when they're in a fight between, uh, with another child at that age, it's great to be mediator and say, now it's your turn to speak and now it's your turn to speak and let's hear from both. And what do you both think could be the way that you could solve this? How can you both work together? How can we make things right again? If they damage something, take the time to have them repair it. Um, if they talk back to you, to say, I can hear you're angry, but try again. In our family, we speak kindly. Yeah? Um, always showing them that there's a solution to all issues that you want to diffuse confrontation and show them that there, there is a way out. I like to steer clear of timeouts and grounding, um, sending them to the room, because I think it's important for them to learn how to um, work with another person. Of course, if they're really hot <laughs> and they're not able to, to talk with you at the moment, better for them to do that timeout just like you were modeling for them. It's so helpful. The, the last secret I wanted to share is that of being a, a kind, steady friend to yourself. And that all these things I just shared are, are gems that we have in our pocket and that we can't always remember to pull out all the time. But to always remember also that the child really, our, ch our children, they, it's not so much what we say to them that counts. It's who we are, what our actions are. And so to find the way in which we can really take the time to nurture ourselves, so we can be present for them, that we can have the self-discipline and the, and the enthusiasm to want to, to try these creative ideas. And Steiner, I think, was very very helpful for me in that way that he, he shared a number of exercises for us to work on um, to really reach that self-awareness. <coughs> like for instance, I'll give you a few. In the morning before you jump out of bed, to really just set your intentions for the day. To go over, what's my day going to be like? What's, what's my child's day going to be like? Do I need to cut out something? Do I need to make sure I bring a snack? Do I need to make sure we can get to the park and just run around for a bit? So that you really have a, a picture of the day of how you want it to go and set that intention. Another one I love of his, uh, I think it's from him, but I heard it from a uh, uh, Waldorf teacher by the name of Els Gotkins. And that is that when you're, you're just like over the top, you don't know what to do, you'd visualize a uh, beam of golden light right behind you and then you just step into it and it's amazing when you do that and you don't say anything 
And I've done this with a group of children, <laughs> with a whole class. And they look at you and wondering, and they can just feel that your energy has shifted. And you don't have, you don't stay in there very long. You don't say anything. I've never told the kids what I was doing. But it just is a way for them to see you calm down and for you to calm down <laughs> um, and move forward. Um, I love to see my, try to think of my child as someone else's child. That was a big help to me. And I learned that as being a teacher, that I realized, wow, I have a whole lot more patience and understanding for other people's kids than my own. <laughs> and so when I feel that heat coming up, I just say, oh, I'm going to think of, of uh, Zach as Vicki Bell's son, not my son, and that will help. And it always did. Um, and lastly, to take the time, well, I should say two more things. I think it's key that we don't um, chastise ourselves, that we don't judge ourselves, and that we, we look for any way for, for us to, to be kind to ourselves in that we know we're striving, and if a day doesn't go so well, we have tomorrow. <laughs> and to realize that if we don't give ourselves enough time, then it's hard to give our children that time. So that, I think, is one last thing I really want to share. And then the, the other is that to take um, a few minutes in the evening and instead of doing a preview, you do a review. And it's interesting to go backwards in the day, Steiner says. Remember the last thing you did, then the thing before that, the thing before that, and go back all the way to the morning. And don't, don't be uh, subjective. Just be objective and notice. And see if maybe, maybe there's certain times of the day that you notice that you really lose it, that you have no more energy. You have no more etheric energy, no more emotional energy to give them. Maybe you, you notice that after a couple of evenings, maybe a couple of months, and you realize, hmm, maybe if I just take a time to go out for a run right before, maybe I'll have that energy then, or maybe I need a snack right then, yeah? And so you find, you find some keys. Sometimes I just put up a question at the end of that review of something I really want help with, and I just ask that question, and it's kind of like my own little story to myself, <laughs> and then I go to sleep. Sometimes the next morning the answer comes. Sometimes it's not till a week later when I'm driving down the road, but often some kind of insight comes. So I think I've given us a few minutes, about five minutes, to just see if you have any questions or comments. Yes. So I have a question with how do you help a child with their, with their fears? Say again? Uh, how do you help a child with their fears? Mm -hmm. For instance, if, if my child's having a hard time sleeping on her own mm -hmm. and so she's getting to the point of having nightmares about it, how do you help them through that mm -hmm. process? Yeah, I think first off to not say don't be afraid and not saying that you, you do, but I think sometimes we want to make it go away. Um, I think to, to listen to, to what the fears are, um, to try to see if you can gain any insight as to where they might have come from. Um, I think telling, telling stories about um, Animals that have overcome feeling small, um, feeling afraid of something, and they overcame it. You know, again, um, storytelling can be an amazing gift. Um, you know, I have. I would want to ask you more questions about the fear. So maybe after afterwards, you can let me know a few more things. But in general, I think those are helpful. And 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 I think also to know that. You know, again, um, nightmares can be frightening. I know I, just as a um, picture of that, I had a recurring nightmare um, when I was a kid, and I didn't want to go to sleep at night. And so my, my, brothers, my brother and my sisters created a story 
it was a big blob coming after me. And so they, they told me how when that came up that I needed to just turn around and say, go away. You know, and they made me laugh, and, but they gave me courage. And the nightmare went away. <laughs> yes? Sometimes there are little tricks, too. It's more of a, like a counseling thing, but you know, you can have your child do just a minor thing, like they picture the thing they're afraid of, and then they change the visual. Like maybe they suddenly have a big wig on or a tutu or, you know, whatever that thing is that's scaring them because it's hard to unsee that after that. Mm -hmm. So I used to do that with my daughter when she had nightmares. And slowly the, the thing just disappeared because it didn't have that power anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you remember Mr. Nobody? Yes. Can you talk about Mr. Nobody and how <laughs> Mr. Nobody could be used? Yeah, so uh, Mr. Nobody um, can come into a classroom or a house and, you know, sometimes move people's things so that they don't know where they are. Uh, he can, you know, knock on the door and then you go to answer it and nobody's there. Mr. Nobody's, he's there, obviously. You know, he can, he can be one that can, can do things that, you know, really just don't make any sense at all. Um, he can also be very helpful if you need someone to pitch in, because he's, you know, he's got his impish side, but he also is right there to, to help you if you need something. I don't know if you have any other ways that Mr. Nobody can help. I remember, you know, things could happen that weren't what you wanted to happen mm -hmm. with children. Mm -hmm. You know, they may have um, torn a book or something, and nobody wants to own up to it. And I remember that Mr. Nobody did it, and I'm not quite sure how that was helpful, but you did that, and it seemed to be okay. So how, how does something like that with Mr. Nobody help, you know, I mean, how can you use Mr. Nobody in, in that kind of situation where something wrong has been done, mm -hmm. but it's not a big deal. <coughs> you, you want them to understand that it's not right, but mm -hmm. you're not going to make a big deal, and so instead Mr. Nobody did it. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I'm trying to recollect. <laughs> but I mean, to me, I would feel like the child who did it does know he did it. And so to speak to Mr. Nobody, or to say, you know, I'll need to, I need to talk to him about how that just doesn't help, you know. So I would say that there needs to be that added bit so that Mr. Nobody's clear not to do it again. And I mean, I'm sure thinking back, I probably acted like he was talking to me. You're like, okay, good. I'm glad you understand that now, you know. And we'll move on. Yes. I, my, my daughter has a Mr. Nobody <laughs> for a period of time when she was like about four or five years old. And mm -hmm. I, I read somewhere, I don't remember where anymore, but it says one way to do is to have, have it's, it's, it's kind of like Mr. Nobody's her responsibility. So I, we, what we tell her is, is that, okay, then you need to tell Mr. Nobody to, you know, this is not the right thing to do or, or ask if you're talking to a child and have her talk to Mr. Nobody. And eventually, I kind of disappears. <laughs> You know, I think it has to be on a couple of fronts because, um, you know, often the younger child w wants to always be with the older child and the older child wants some time alone. Is that true for you at times? <laughs> you know, I don't know that the older one will voice that. He only uh -huh. benefits from time alone. Uh -huh. But he won't necessarily say that. So instead, you know, he wants to control how everything goes. But mm -hmm. now the younger one is coming into his own. So there's just lots of head budding all over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, again, I think to, to try to structure their, you know, have a rhythm of the day 
so that you almost preempt that kind of um, fighting, if you can, bickering. So, you know, that might mean that you bring that form of saying, okay, now it's time for the six-year-old is going to go and play here, and the three-year-old, you know, we're going to do some reading, and then you can go back to playing, yeah? Or you're going to, I need your help, six-year-old, to come and, and do this, and let the three-year-old play a bit on, on his own. I just see, I see that with the four-year-old twins, that they can play well together. They've had to learn to negotiate from the get-go, um, so that, that has helped them. Your six-year-old hasn't, you know, it's been a while since that, you know, he hasn't had to learn that. So I think, it, again, another piece to that is to have them play together and to, to be there, to be the negotiator, yeah, and um, to be to be clear that, you know, this is how we do it in our family. Yeah. Now your brother's getting older and he wants to have some say in it. So he gets to have his say for three minutes and then it'll be your turn. You know, that back and forth, that, that has helped a lot with, with the twins, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's such a, it's such a wonderful thing to have a younger in the house for sometimes the older to be able to go back and play in that realm, yes. you know, and that's always so nice. But I do see, I have a, so 16, 10, and 6. And the 16, the, the 16 year old and the 10 year old, the 10 year old is starting to feel a really deep, painful separation from his older brother who isn't wanting to go now mm -hmm. into that realm of, you know, he's really separating. And that, it seems to be, like along with the 90, it just adds to that nine year shade. And I don't always really know what he's like. How come my brother's not like he used to be? You know, we used to have fun. Mm -hmm. You know, and it really kind of breaks my heart. And it's not that they don't do sometimes, but mm -hmm. I don't really know how to help the middle child with that. Mm -hmm. He likes to play with his little sister too, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a distance. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you might be able to find something that the 16 year old would like to do with the 10 year old that's new and different you know, to talk with him and say, you know, your brother's missing you. And really you're, you know, I understand that you're moving out of that phase, but I wonder if we, you and I could come up with something that you could do special with him. So, yeah. You know, maybe doing, maybe doing some kind of purposeful work, <laughs> you know, something that your 16 year old likes doing, but wouldn't mind to have the 10 year old tag along. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'll let you get home for the evening. Yeah. Happy New Year.